Vice Provost Teaching and Learning, who's going to talk to us about all the cool things that are happening at Brock. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Anne. Well, you're certainly among the very cool things happening at Brock, but good morning, everyone. Um, as Anne said, I'm Rajiv Jangiani. I serve as Brock's Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, which means I have the great privilege of supporting the wonderful team in our Center for Pedagogical Innovation. Um, and it does feel particularly appropriate that you are MC this morning because it really feels like you're handing over from your wonderful webinar last month to, to Brenna today. But I do want to thank everybody for attending our second webinar. Uh, thrilled to, uh, to, of course, support folks. This is this whole series. Is is designed to support our community of educators in areas of greatest need. Uh, but I'm especially thrilled that we're welcoming such a, a bright light and a source of inspiration uh, in Dr. Brenna Clark Gray today, uh, whom I will say we have long admired at Brock, um, who models so well uh, the vision of teaching and learning that is reflected in our academic plan. This is teaching that is inclusive, accessible, trauma-informed, anti-racist, and certainly critical. But in particular, I'll point to two goals in our new academic plan that align with the topic of today's webinar, uh, which is, uh, there's one goal, which is goal 1B, which is about investing in the development of robust professional development opportunities for faculty, academic staff, and graduate students, including in the design of effective learning experiences and assessments across all course delivery modes. Uh, and of course, another one uh, which has to do with uh, focusing efforts on curriculum review and program reimagination to allow for a well-designed mix of online, uh, online on-campus and blended course options. So that's just a bit of, of connection to the academic plan itself, but more than anything, uh, I think you know we continue in CPI to want to try to find ways to better serve our community of ed educators. We see the wor work that people are doing, especially when you extend yourself to try and make your learning environments, uh, design them and deliver those experiences for students in a way that makes them feel supported and welcomed and a sense of belonging. So it's with great delight that uh, I, we welcome you here today, Brenna, uh, and Anne, happy to hand things back to you and keen to keen to listen and learn. Thanks so much, Rajiv. Um, so yes, here we are. It's my honor uh, to to introduce Dr. Brenna Clark Gray, who's a coordinator of educational technologies at Thompson Rivers University, where her research interests include the pedagogical implications of generative AI, the history and future of open tenure processes, the role of care and care work. Uh, in the practice of educational technology and scholarly podcasting. Prior to a transition to faculty support, she spent nine years as a community college English professor and comic scholar. Uh, she holds a PhD in Canadian literature from the University of New Brunswick. And outside of Academy's walls, Brenna co-hosts Hazel and Katniss and Harry and Star, a podcast about young adult literature and film adaptation, and pretends uh, at the role uh, of public intellectual on social media. She, that's her words, not mine. She does a very good job of that. Um, when Where you can find her in many places, but not X, sadly, uh, at Brenna C. Gray. And so with that, Brenna, I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Are my slides showing? Does that look like a slide deck to you guys? Awesome. That's great news. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much, everybody. and Thank you for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be talking about um, assessment uh, and maybe more about generative AI than uh, than Julian and Han anticipated because that's where my head is at these days. Um, I also off the top just want to uh, apologize. Apologize is a strong word. Uh, I may lose my voice. It may come in and out. I'm I'm in the midst of a very long uh, COVID recovery. So just a heads up if I sound quite raspy, that's what's going on here. But I have my trusty water bottle and I anticipate making it through this conversation today. Um, please feel welcome to share thoughts and ideas in the chat as we go along. You're more than welcome to. Um, I will try to keep an eye on it as we go. Um, I'm really interested in thinking about how assessment practice in the classroom, in blended environments, online, um, how that is really being sort of shaped by some of our conversations around generative AI. Um, and if you read my little synopsis for the talk today, you'll see that the metaphor we'll be torturing today is the metaphor of the snipe hunt, um, which I will get into in more detail. But when I asked uh, a, a, a generative AI image generation tool to give me an image of a snipe. Uh, it couldn't have done any better for all the points I want to make today because it gave me this very sweet bird uh, with three legs. And that's really what we're going to talk about um, today a little bit anyway, is how the ways in which AI, you know, 
students are producing assessments using it often that like look good on the surface. It's a very clear image of a bird um, that have significant problems like, you know, like a, like a third leg. Uh, and, and part of what I want to talk about today is how we talk to students about the limitations in this technology, some of the ethical ramifications in that, this technology, and allow them to make good choices about their own assessment practice themselves. So these are the things I want to talk about today. I can't stop looking at his great little, little third leg. It just delights me. Something fierce. Um, before I start, I do want to acknowledge that I'm a visitor in Tecumseh State Sequatin territory in the unceded traditional lands of Sequatin. Um, it is glorious here. It is cold uh, with beautiful clear skies. This is a picture um, of the woods in Nutsford, which you may or may not be aware, but Nutsford is uh, just to the south of Kamloops, uh, and it's the area that was very, um, very dramatically impacted by fires this summer. Um, you know, and I think a lot about the connections between educational technologies, the choices we make in assigning um, technologies and tools to students, and those extractive properties that Anne was talking about earlier. We're going to talk a bit today about water and climate implications of generative AI, and because I do think that should shape some of the choices we make in the classroom. Um, it's a relief to be in, in cool weather here in, in Tecumseh. Um, I also just want to share, you know, decolonization, I'm not even sure the university as a structure is capable of it, but it is a process of actions, not just words. Um, and uh, I encourage you to support local organizations. For me, an organization that I uh, support financially um, when I give talks like this is the Raven Trust. They offer legal support to land and water defenders, particularly um, in this region. All right, I welcome you to share anything I talk about today on social media. Uh, my running joke is that everything that comes out of my mouth has a CC BYNC license, which is to say, as long as you're not using it commercially, you can share it anywhere you like. And uh, I can be found on many social media, just not Twitter, uh, at Brenna C. Gray. So please feel free to find me there after the fact, um, but also to share anything you like, including screenshots um, from today's session. That's totally fine with me. So uh, Anne alluded to my context a little bit. I'm gonna share a little bit more. So as Anne said, I, I spent nine years as a community college English instructor and I transitioned to faculty support in 2019. Um, I have comically bad timing. I transitioned seven months before the pandemic because I was seeking a better work-life balance than I had as full-time faculty. I really wanted to like try to have more time at home, uh, try to bring less work home that lasted seven months uh, and now my work is at home, uh, but you know, the choices we make. Um, as a coordinator of educational technologies, I have this great role where I get to balance technical and pedagogical support with institutional guiding and framing for new technologies. Um, and it's a really privileged position to be in because it means that um, I get to try to help people make better choices, but also try to encourage the institutional structure to uh, support those choices more effectively. Um, I think it's important to note, even as I'm going to talk about the pedagogical implications of AI today, that I am really suspicious of expertise. When we talk about this, these technologies are extremely new, um, and particularly generative AI's widespread adoption in post-secondary is extremely new. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some emergent research with you today. But I think anybody who says they know definitively the correct answer when it comes to adopting or not adopting these technologies, uh, I view that with great suspicion. Um, and as you may see by the end of the talk today, I am um, kind of a killjoy. So what do I mean by that? Well, we'll explore that as we go along. Oh, and just a note, I hope you have downloaded the slides. Uh, where appropriate, there's citations and uh, further reading throughout the slide deck in the notes section. So please. Uh, do check that out if you have questions. Um, so I wanted to open today by asking what your role is uh, and what brings you to the conversation today in the chat. So are you mostly teaching online? Are you mostly teaching in a blended context? Are you in a faculty support kind of role? Um, what's going on with you in terms of what your background is? Uh, and how are you feeling about AI in particular? Uh, and I've given some suggestions. Are you excited, hopeful, deeply paranoid, way too tired at this point in the semester to care? all totally valid perspectives. I'd love it if you would share uh, in the chat um, what, where you're at, how you've come to this conversation today and how you're feeling uh, as you arrive here.
<laughs> all of the above. Yes, depends on the day, Julia. I also, I, uh, I understand that that all of the above feeling for sure. I can wait a very awkwardly long time. I just, it's important that you all know that. I can, I can be uncomfortable for extended period. I taught English for nine years. I can ask a question and wait for a long time. <laughs> so associate professor at Brock, feeling excited, hopeful, cautious, welcome. So much potential, but I don't know how to use it. Yes, that's a big piece of it, right? And so often I end up in these meetings where someone's like, well, we have to teach students to use it responsibly. And I'm like, cool, do you know how to use it responsibly? Because I'm not convinced I do, right? It's brand, brand new. Where is the expertise? Who are we leaning into? Teaching in a blended environment, feeling hopeful about AI, but cautious. Teaching blended, curious about potential of uh, AI to challenge perceptions of authentic knowledge. And we'll talk about that for sure today. Um, how do we protect instructor and student work from bad terms and conditions? Oh, yes, you might be my new best friend. Uh, student life and success here for the learner's perspective. Yes, yeah, students are saying they're both excited and confused about AI. Definitely don't fight it. Learn to understand it. Cool. Among other things, approaching this moment with great empathy for educators who are coping with yet another wave of imposed change. Yeah, it does feel like and I mean, this is the ahistoricity of one's own perspective for sure, but I do feel like I rolled into educational technology and hit the pandemic and then hit kind of contract cheating and then hit, or maybe I hit contract cheating first and then the pandemic and then AI. And it does feel like there's always some new explosive moment. Oh, representing accreditation and quality assurance and the regulars need for assurance of learning. Fascinating perspective. Not one I'm sure I address particularly well, but I'm eager to hear your thoughts. A librarian excitement but try not to be paranoid love it sign a lot of research papers and love supporting skills and growth in that area looking for how to support those skills with the high students just resort to ai and not actually learn these are all great thoughts and they're all going to intersect in a lot of what we talk about today um but i hope that if we don't touch on your particular context that you'll um draw us into that space in the question so that we can we can hear a range of different perspectives i'm really eager to hear um you're going to hear more oh yeah okay want to know the best ways to use ai well i'm going to talk a little bit about that today um but maybe from a maybe more negative perspective but we'll see we'll jump in together let me tell you about my metaphor of the day this is another ai generated image that i pulled up um which is why the, the child does not have fingers probably um and also why you can't see it in the color that I've changed, but these badges all have like sort of uh, hieroglyphic type kind of like zaft wingbat type font in the text on them. It's very interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it's trying to represent, but we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I don't know if you've ever been sent on a snipe hunt. It's a very particular type of sort of, I think, maybe even just largely Eastern North American uh, kind of practical joke. Um, in existence in North America as early as the 1840s. The idea is you have a newcomer, it's often a camp game, which is why I have my little Boy Scouts here, um, in which an unsuspecting newcomer is duped into trying to catch an elusive, non-existent animal called a snipe. Although snipe are an actually fa actual family of birds, a snipe hunt is a quest for an imaginary creature whose description varied. So when I heard this, it was kind of like a weaselly type creature. Um, what, I'm, what I'm interested in, when I talk about the snake hunt is this idea of this imaginary creature whose description varies that we have to go out and catch or go out and manage or go out and attend to without a lot of additional information. And I feel that way often when I think about generative AI and assessment practice because we're being told by a lot of different um, high priced webinars, uh, a lot of different like online courses you can take right now that there is some kind of definitive answer either to AI proofing your assessments or to ensuring your assessments um, are embracing AI in the best possible way. And to me, all of this feels a lot like a snipe hunt. I'm not sure what the target is. I'm not sure how to get there. I'm holding a big bag, but I think my bag might have on the bottom of it. Um, and it feels often like this unwinnable task. It's also a useful, I think, demonstration of AI's limitations because in this case, uh, I, I, my 
prompt, I think it's in the alt text and now I can't draw that up, but my prompt was something like um, a boy scout on uh, an impossible quest or searching for an imaginary prey, I think. Um, but my, my search for the, my generative term for the first image, that one of the bird was a snipe hunt. We are generating the image of a snipe as like a boy scout would search for in a snipe hunt. And instead it gives me this bird, right? The snipe family, which is totally accurate except for the third leg, but lacks all the cultural context around the idea of a snipe hunt. And I could not seem to generate a prompt that got the AI to consider that cultural context. So that had me thinking too. So as I note, the metaphor we'll be torturing today is snipe hunt. Um, is the AI proof assessment a mystery prey that doesn't exist? There are certainly practices that we can engage in that would discourage students from drawing on a generative AI tool because they are about reflection, about the student's own experience, those kinds of things for sure. But that notion of AI proofness, like that bar is always gonna be moving on us as the technology changes and develops. I also think though, there's another snipe hunt piece, which is the focus on academic integrity. Um, it's not that I don't think academic integrity matters. Well, it depends on the day, but most days it's not that I don't think academic integrity matters, but I, I worry about the narrow frame with which we discuss it. And this is often true for those of us who teach in blended and online environments. There can be a real pressure around um, a particular definition of academic integrity, ensuring that students have completed the work themselves. And while that is obviously important for all kinds of reasons that have even come up in the chat already today, quality assurance and degree regulation and all those kinds of things, um, I think that the question of academic integrity maybe needs to be more encompassing, especially as we move into this period of time that um, someone like uh, Professor Sarah Eaton at the University of Calgary is calling the, the post-plagiarism era. I'm not sure that language is accurate, but we'll get there. So I do feel like in all of these assessment workshops about artificial intelligence, and I feel like I've been to a lot of them um, to the point where when, when Julia asked me if I would come and do this one, I was like, yes, I rock, great, love it, totally gonna come. Don't know if I have anything new to say. Um, and part of that is because we already know how to design good assessments. And I don't believe like at the core, the practices that we know work have changed all that much. I think that when assignments are, you know, I've already seen some keywords come up in the chat, authentic, um, when they connect to student experience, when they're deeply tied to our learning objectives, um, when students understand why the assessment matters, I think that all of those things are just as insulating against AI as they were against contract cheating, as they were against traditional plagiarism before that. But there's a reason we don't do those assignments often, right? There's a reason why we end up in the same kinds of rote assessment practices. Um, and it's not necessarily because they're the best tools for learning. The things that tend to get in our way are structural, not technological, large class sizes, limited amount of prep, lack of security for instructors, uh, lack of teaching supports. These are the things that tend to stop us from doing what we already know is good assessment practice. And that's kind of the tenor of our conversation today. I'm gonna say you already know what to do and, and hopefully support you to do it within the very real confines of the context in which we teach and learn. Uh, so this is a model of post-plagiarism. The link is in the slides. Um, this is Dr. Sarah Eaton's work at the University of Calgary, and she's developing, in the process of developing this model called the six tenets of post-plagiarism, writing in the age of general, of artificial intelligence. And I'm not sure I 100% buy the post-plagiarism moniker, and I have had this conversation with Dr. Eaton herself, so I'm not telling tales out of school here, but I mean, truly the whole model of generative AI is based on plagiarism, right? Like, I'm not sure we can be post plagiarism when the whole thing is rooted in a lack of respect for intellectual property uh, and, you know, just sort of hugely trolled databases from all parts of the internet. So, you know, I, I quibble with the moniker a little bit, but I do think that there are a lot of aspects here that she's right about. Um, this notion that hybrid, human AI writing will become normal. I think many of us are already seeing this in our classrooms. And let me tell you, 
I got an email last week from a service unit that will remain nameless at my institution. Um, and the link in the middle of it failed, didn't work. And that was weird because it, it, it's a unit that doesn't normally make those kinds of errors. And then when I did like a little inspection on the link that they had sent, the reason the link didn't work is because it was uh, the filler link that ChatGPT uses when it doesn't have access to the link you wanted to insert, right? So human hybrid AI is already a part of my working life and it's probably a part of your working life too. The extent to which you're aware of it will depend on your context. Um, humans can relinquish control, but not responsibility. This is something that I've been talking about a lot with students um, is the idea that you're still responsible for it, right? Just because the AI spits it out, first of all, doesn't mean that it's true or necessarily real. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that today for sure. Um, but also that you are still responsible. You're responsible for it as your assignment, but you're also responsible for it, you know, at the level of prompt engineering, potentially. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today too. Um, this one attribution remains important and this is a big piece that i've been talking about a lot with anyone who will listen which is the idea that what we need in a policy context right now is a push for transparency so that email that i got from the service unit that will remain nameless did not disclose that it had been generated with generative ai it just appeared on my desk as though it had been written by a human and that's the part of it that i have a problem with right because I think that when we talk about like cultures of academic integrity, like we say that a lot, but we usually just mean like a set of rules for students to follow, right? But a true culture of academic integrity, a true culture of, of integrity period, um, would involve us all modeling appropriate behaviors. And one of the appropriate behaviors, I think we, I hope we can all agree to, is a fair amount of transparency at attributing where our work comes from. Um, saying when we've used AI, which AI we've used. These are all, I think, important components. Um, and Sarah's a much more, oh, sorry, Sarah's a much more optimistic person than I am. So she sees a lot of ways to enhance create human creativity um, and for language barriers to disappear. I do agree with this. I think that the better AI gets at helping us to um, maybe flatten uh, the differences between learners and allow a more level playing field, particularly around language learning. I think that's true. But we're in this liminal space right now, right? Where, you know, I've been in, in chatting with students, one of the things that comes up, particularly with English language learners, is this idea of like this sort of false choice, right? Between being absolutely nailed to the wall on poor, poor grammar or the way they articulate themselves and being nailed to the wall on using generative AI. <laughs> like those, are, those feel like the two choices for a lot of populations of learners right now. So we may be on our way to this, but I don't think we're here yet. I think there's still a huge inequity in the way different groups of students are treated when they make errors um, and the choices that get made around that and the consequences for them. But here's the part, historical definitions of plagiarism no longer apply it's at least different, right? And it's at least part of a conversation around assessment that we need to be having with learners, particularly if we're making use of generative AI built on other people's intellectual property without citation. I think it changes the way we talk about intellectual property and academic integrity, or maybe, maybe it should. Anyway, the link is in the slides. Please feel free to explore Dr. Eden's thoughts on that more. She goes into a, a lengthy blog post where she breaks those all down. Um, so it's not, I'm not trying to argue that nothing has changed, but I do think that maybe the things that have changed are not really about the practice of developing assessment. And that's the argument I wanna make with you today. But before I do, I can't talk about generative AI without sharing some important qualms. Um, I want to talk a little bit about things like labor, um, sustainability. Um, there are sort of important key issues that underpin these technologies. And oftentimes, we don't make space for them in our discussions because we're really concerned about the here and now, right? Like my student is using generative AI right now, and I don't know how to respond to that in this moment. And so we tend to react um, for, for very good reason. And I work in a role that is 
highly reactive. Um, but finding the time and space and mental energy to take a step back and think about where these technologies even fit in the landscape of our values within our institutions, I think is also really important. And so that's what I wanna take some time here to do today. There we go. So I wanna start with the ethics of labor. And many people know this now after the really fantastic time expose, which I have linked in the, in the notes um, for this slide and I really encourage you to check out. If you are new to the conversation around chat GPT, you know, as of, maybe last November when it landed, you might not be aware that ChatGPT is largely based on GPT 3.5 if you're using the free version, GPT 4 if you pay. But before that, there was GPT 3. Well, there were many GPTs before, but GPT 3 was really the first one, I think, that a lot of those of us who were working in composition circles became aware of because that was really the first to my memory anyway, the first sort of flood of like, oh, this technology can write an essay. <clears throat> the thing about GPT-3 was it was super sexist, super violent, super racist. So the things that it came out with were often unusable. And many technologies built on this tool, like, um, oh, I can't remember it. Well, maybe it was Bing's chatbot that they tried to release to Twitter. Was it Bing? Somebody made a chatbot that they released to Twitter. And like within moments, it was espousing Nazi ideology. There's this, this technology just seemed to be so rooted in the most violent, aggressive, horrific components of the internet. It was hard to imagine how it could ever be ready for, you know, quote unquote, prime time. Well, how a technology gets ready for prime time is usually exploitation. So what happened was um, OpenAI, the company that uh, makes the GPT technologies, um, outsourced labor to workers in Kenya um, to tag language in the LLM that they were to determine was like sort of toxic or not. Um, these workers made about $1.32 to $2 US per hour. And the work is wildly traumatizing. So workers described the data sets they were exposed to as including violent sexual assaults and child abuse materials. Um, one of the reasons this is, I'm going to rewind slightly, but one of the reasons why content moderation is so bad across the internet is because it's hard to do. Um, it's very expensive to do because it's extremely taxing. It's extremely traumatizing on the workers who are forced to look at it. And so increasingly, those populations of workers have either unionized and demanded better pay or companies have gone to increasingly vulner vulnerable workforces to source that labor. Um, the reality is that exploited labor in educational technologies, especially in the global south, is often invisibilized. And I'm not saying that other technologies are somehow better, but this is something that we know <laughs> happened, right? We know that the only reason that ChatGPT is usable by populations primarily in the global north is because of the exploitation that occurred in the global south. And we need to also think about the role of what we have to say about decolonization in this process, right? Because the reason why populations in Kenya and India are often exploited for this labor is because of a colonized education system that has those workers educated in English. And so like these things are all deeply intertwined um, and it's, a frustration to me often that it's very difficult as institutions to sort of take that one step back from our discussions of decolonization in a campus context to look at the systems in which we participate beyond the context of our work. And again, I'm not trying to make an argument like, so therefore don't use these technologies. I understand the pressure we are all under to maintain currency, but I, I think that it's disingenuous to not have this larger conversation when we do talk about our values. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little second too. Um, we've already talked about this in sort of oblique terms, but the ethics of the data sets themselves, the data for this work is scraped from the internet without the original creator's consent. If you were posting on the internet at all prior to 2019, but specifically if you were a Redditor prior to 2019, you absolutely have content in this data set 
that you were never, you never consented to in any kind of meaningful way. What's interesting though, is that then the data becomes a proprietary component of the AI tool, right? And often not disclosed because here we, we get into this issue of competitive advantage. So I can't tell you what data I stole to make my data set because now it's my competitive advantage. Um, I think about this a lot in the higher ed context because I think of things like plagiarism detection tools like Turnitin and the ways in which that technology creates massive data sets of student writing, which has then gone on to generate um, tools, right, that students can use to now generate text. Like these things are all interconnected. And I, I'm curious about how we have conversations with students in the context of academic integrity when often they're compelled by our institutions to put their work through some of these tools. And likewise, you know, if, if any of you are playing around with um, with AI detection tools, first of all, they're not great, um, but also we need to think about where we're sending student data and what might be done with that in the next iteration. Like, I think we can draw a pretty clear line from sort of old school cheating to contract cheating by way of Turnitin, right? Like Turnitin in many ways created the market for contract cheating because how do most of those contract cheating firms advertise their services? Oh, well, we guarantee you that you'll, you'll run clear on Turnitin if you purchase our essays, right? So it was this idea of like, we were catching a particular kind of academic dishonesty with this tool and we created this whole other problem. Um, and then there's like uh, massive complications of that, like the equity of cheating, like who can afford to cheat in a way that um, gets around a tool like Turnitin versus who can't. And, you know, it may sound mad to talk about equity and cheating, but I do think it's worth considering. Anyway, all this to say, these technologies are built on a notion of academic, or sorry, these technologies are built on a notion of intellectual property that I don't think many of us would want to support in the abstract. And so what does it mean to engage with these technologies regardless of that troubling underpinning? And then the last thing I wanna talk about today, and there are other things, you know, definitely equity and representation. There's a really great Bloomberg piece um, that I'll try to find the link for after because I didn't bring it with me, but there's a great Bloomberg exploration of um, representation in ChatGPT, like what percentage of the time does ChatGPT position people in authority as men or as white men or as able-bodied white men? Um, and they've done a really incredible visualization of that. So that is a whole other piece to talk about, especially when it comes to what students then go on and do with the content. But the last piece I wanna talk about, my context, living in a desert that catches fire pretty much every year, the ethics of climate justice. So I've included all the sources for this in the slide deck. Some estimates peg the clean water use of a tool like ChatGPT at about 500 milliliters per 20 to 20 or 20 to 50 question set. So um, that was a piece of information that changed my entire approach to discussing generative AI. So prior to learning that, which is it's a very recent um, research, but it's very promising in how it analyzes the cooling of the data centers at the core of ChatGPT's technology. Um, I used to do live ChatGPT demonstrations. Like I'd be like, here's like, let's make Brenna's bio live and we'll go through it together and we'll laugh about how hilarious it is. And I don't do that anymore because the idea of like pouring 500 milliliters of water down the drain when I live, as I say, in a desert seemed like questionably ethical. Um, at the same time, training ChatGPT created the same emissions as 550 return flights between San Francisco and New York. Um, integrating AI into web searches increases the carbon footprint by about four or five times per search. And when you consider that pre-generative AI, global data centers were already responsible for 1% of all carbon emissions, um, I find that to be a staggering number. Um, and I think we need to think about like, how does this complicate institutional priorities around sustainability and environmentalism, right? Like I come from a campus that is very eager to tell you that we are the most sustainable university in North America, but I don't see that reflected in the policy around how we are 
approaching these technologies, which leads me to this question about like, how do we live our values in the world of AI? So I have gone ahead and I just snapped this from the Brock website. These are your stated values as an institution. Um, things like reconciliation and decolonization, things like sustainable, accountable and transparent stewardship. Like how do, and I'm not poking at Brock because I do this to my own institution all the time. How do we align these things? How do we align a full-throated excitement about AI with very little conversation about the ethical ramifications with our values as institutions? And is it even possible for AI tools in their current form to live alongside these values? Now, these things are ever-changing, right? And in fact, if you take a look at that, um, that first source, the one for the water research, those researchers are not condemning AI. What they are trying to do is explore ways to make AI, quote unquote, less thirsty. Um, so this technology is changing. But do we have a realistic understanding of how it functions right now? Um, and are we ready to have the difficult conversations about aligning our values with emergent technologies? Um, I don't think I don't think we are because often we end up in this conversation. Oh, but it's already here. Right. There's nothing we can do, but it's already here. Um, I get it. I get the anxiety around um, feeling like left behind or the notion that, you know, the way we train students to use this technology becomes another piece of competitive advantage, et cetera, et cetera. But I actually think that that makes these conversations um, and sometimes principal refusal where appropriate um, more urgent, not less urgent. Like, I think it's really, really important that our students who are otherwise living in a media ecosystem that is all about the whiz bang excitement of generative AI. I think that in their university classrooms, that needs to be anchored in real conversations about the values and complications. So that when we use a, an AI technology with a student in an assessment context, we can have a conversation about why it's appropriate in that context and how we came to that conclusion. Um, there's some things that generative AI does that's really cool. Like there's a very, I, uh, in one of my nerdier and less ethical pastimes, I watch Formula One racing. I talk about the environment and I watch Formula One racing. I contain multitudes. Um, and there's a whole thing that happens online where fans use the existing body of interviews with these drivers. There's thousands of hours of them talking uh, and they use that to generate um, an AI voice that they then have sing. And they have these videos on TikTok where these drivers are, you know, fake. They're sort of deep fakes of these drivers singing often sort of embarrassing um, songs. And they're funny. And they're also the first one I saw totally got me. I was like, is that really that guy? And then I realized, no, it's not, it's AI. But that's the kind of way that most of us engage with AI is in these kind of whiz bang demonstrations of this like wild technology. So I think grounded conversations need to be happening somewhere. And I'm hoping that they can happen as part of our assessment process. So this is why I think we have an ethical responsibility to teach students to work with these tools and manage their expectations of them. And that doesn't mean positioning ourselves as the experts. I told you off the top, I'm super suspicious of claims of pedagogical expertise in this space. Um, but we can bring these same ethical questions to our learners, especially in contexts where it's appropriate, right? Like if my lesson plan is in a course in environmental studies, then it totally makes sense to have that larger conversation with my learners about the impact of this technology on, on the work that they do. But it also makes sense if it aligns with campus values in a way that we need to have these conversations. Um, I also think, and I'm gonna come back to this idea of teaching at scale. Teaching at scale really makes us vulnerable to assignments being exploited like tools by tools like ChatGPT. So again, you know, that's why I call this like the boogeyman we made ourselves. <laughs> like in so many ways, this kind of ethical quagmire that we find ourselves in, where we're being pushed from all sides um, to embrace this technology that maybe has all these problematic undertones, is a, a, as much driven 
by scale and by um, the casualization of our workforces, by the increasing demands on instructional faculty and teaching assistants and, you know, all, like all of those factors are part of why our assessments are sort of gpt -able. And I always think about this in relation to my own teaching. And when I was, when I was teaching full time, I easily was collecting 120 to 135 written responses of some description a week. Oftentimes 120 to 135 like full on essays, but sometimes, you know, sometimes lesser, lesser written assignments than that, but always about that much writing about every single week. And I know for sure that I was easily seduced by nice grammar and careful form, right? That oftentimes when I was marking that big stack of essays, it was really easy to be like, oh, well, I can read this in one go without a lot of labor on my part, and I can make some comments on it, and it felt easy and I good mark because I didn't have to labor over this assessment. Um, so I think a lot about how easy it would be by the time I hit about assignment 120 at about three o'clock in the morning, how easy it would be to read a chat GPT response that had the right number of paragraphs, put all the sentences in basically the right order, was easy to read from a grammar perspective and didn't say very much. I could totally be drawn in by that at that point. And it's part of the reason why it, I didn't think it was great for me to continue that kind of teaching because I could see the ways in which I was the scale I was being asked to work at was complicating my notions of like assessment, right? So I wanna put that out on the table because we can't always make the choices we wanna make based on our context. So let me just put that on the table. Um, and I do think, you know, as, as uh, Sarah Eaton notes, there are potential strengths for AI learners, really, really cool ones. Um, Access flattening for non-native language speakers, neurodiverse students, and anyone who might struggle with the blank page. The number one thing I hear from students who have played with ChatGPT in particular is, gosh, it helps me figure out like what the keywords are and what the questions I should even be asking are, right? Because oftentimes our learners come to their writing assessments with very little sort of scaffolding and support, depending on how they've arrived in this classroom at this assignment in this moment. And yeah, being able to say to a tool like, this is the question I want to ask, but what else? Or like, this is the topic I have, but I don't even know what questions to ask about it. I can absolutely see the, the not just the value, but like the importance of that for a lot of learners. Many of you are taking advantage of improved captioning. The team's captioning is so much better than captioning was even five years ago, even three years ago. Uh, even when you know we hit the ground running with the um, campus closure period of the pandemic, the the technology has expanded and improved in leaps and bounds. And the same thing with automated alt text. So alt text is you know the text that we uh, assign to an image so that a screen reader can do something with it. I used to just ignore PowerPoint suggestions for automated alt text because they were so terrible. And now they're actually a pretty good starting point. I usually want to add more details, but at least, you know, it used to just say you'd have a picture of a tree and it would say, uh, let me generate some alt text for you. Uh, this is a picture. And I'd be like, thanks for that. Not very helpful. But now it knows that that's a tree. Sometimes it knows it's like a tree at sunset. So these kinds of technologies that improve access for our learners, now I'm not standing in the way of. And I think when we do, um, when we do a risk benefit analysis, we do need to consider which populations of students and how we're seeing improvements uh, and better access. I also think there's a great potential for uh, AI to be used as a research starting point. Um, if you downloaded the slides, you'll see I've highlighted a tool called Goblin Tools. It's goblin.tools if you go to it online. Um, this is, I think, my favorite application of AI and one of the few that I sort of recommend um, without caveat, because so often when I see learners struggling with an assessment, it's because they don't have the scaffolding in place. They don't know where to go. And Goblin Tools breaks down any task into 
smaller tasks. And then you can break down any one of those smaller tasks into micro tasks. So you can put in, write a research paper and it will give the student like 20 steps that they need to follow to get themselves going on their research paper. And any one of those individual steps, like check sources for accuracy, you can click on and you can expand that further. So it explains like what that means and how we access those tools and who do you go to for supports. I think that is an amazing tool. It also, Gollum Tools also has this one that I'm slightly skeptical of where you just put in all the groceries in your fridge and it generates a recipe. I haven't tried any of those yet. If you cook anything Goblin tells you to cook, I'd be curious. But from that idea of like breaking down major tasks for learners, I see that as a huge potential. So it's not like I'm arguing that we shouldn't ever use generative AI. I'm not naive, but I do think framing and discussing limitations with students is really important. And here's an example of where I think we should be talking about limitations with our learners. And this is really easy to read on my big screen, maybe hard to read on your screens, but do download the slides and you can take a look at the example. I'll just give it to you in broad brush strokes. So what are the research implications for the way we prompt? I think that's a big piece that we should be talking to students about and maybe even demoing with students. So I asked ChatGPT two prompts and I asked it to please summarize Brenna Clark Gray's plagiarism controversy in 200 words. So notice how this prompt assumes a plagiarism controversy exists, right? ChatGPT is very happy to summarize the time I plagiarized multiple passages of my book, Strangers on the Beach, St. Kilda Stories. So a couple of important things. I have not, in fact, been involved in a plagiarism scandal. I did not write a book called Strangers on the Beach, St. Kilda Stories. And as far as I can gather from the internet, such a book does not exist. So keeping those three important caveats in mind, we have this great 200 word, not only what I plagiarized, not only the consequences of my plagiarism, but also how I took steps to address the situation. I mean, I'm nothing if not owning my completely fake scandals. Um, but check out this prompt. So in this prompt, I said, do you have evidence of Brenna Clark Gray being involved in plagiarism in 2020? Oh, I apologize for any confusion in my previous response. My knowledge is based on information available up to September 2021, and I do not have specific up-to-date, blah, 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 blah. I do not have any knowledge of Brenna Clark Gray's involvement in a plagiarism controversy in 2020 or at any other time. If such an event occurred, I recommend consulting reliable news sources or academic reports for the most accurate and up-to-date information on the matter. So these responses were like 30 seconds apart. Um, wow, there's a big difference in the way we prompt and what comes out. And here we come back to that notion of, <clears throat> accountability, right? We come back to that notion of talking to students about being responsible for what they submit because this one is libelous, right? Like if you put this in the newspaper, I'd be like, um, excuse me. And recognizing that when ChatGBT or any of these other tools generate something, it's using predictive models. So when I say, please summarize Brenna Clark Gray's plagiarism controversy in 200 words, at no point does the AI tool stop to wonder if this happened, because that's not its job. Its job is to generate a summary of this plagiarism controversy. It doesn't exist, but that doesn't matter, because it knows generally what a plagiarism controversy looks like, and it can use its predictive models to write something that looks very, I mean, if I just saw this and I didn't see the little GPT logo, I'd be like, wow. And Brenna's a jerk. Look at all that plagiarism she's been doing, right? So we really need to be thinking about not just telling students like, yes, use AI or no, don't use AI, but really exploring with them the limitations and their own accountability for the limitations of the technology. So now I get into my like, I'm wearing my assessment hat and giving you ideas. It's changing hats from conspiracy theorist to assessment person. Um, some things that ChatGPT is really good at that you might want to avoid, I would say particularly in the fully online context when you maybe don't always have as much back and forth with learners, um, but in general, these assignments are very chatgpt able So format assignments, kinds of assignments that are like write two paragraphs and have five sources. If you tell ChatGPT to write two paragraphs and have five sources, it's going to write two paragraphs and have five sources. It might make up the five sources, but Regardless, if you're marking 200 assignments, 
there's a level at which you're looking to make sure it has two paragraphs and five sources, right? And so those are highly GPT-able assessments. Um, ChatGPT is really good at surface summaries of texts, even relatively obscure ones. When ChatGPT first dropped, I had a colleague at another institution who has always used this one very obscure text with her learners as a summary assignment because she felt it was unplagiarizable because nobody else was using this text. I once pointed out, like, except for every student you've taught for the last 15 years, but regardless of that, it was a fairly obscure text and that students couldn't just Google it and find an answer. Um, it was absolutely something that ChatGPT was happy to summarize and actually fairly accurately. So when we're looking for surface summaries of text, those still may be a useful task for part of the research process, but we maybe don't want to be evaluating them as students' own work. They're very easy to, to chat GPT. Uh, summaries of historical events, even without, po uh, without point of view. So if we just want kind of a, like chat GPT is very centrist in the history that it outlines, very mainstream representations of sort of historical thought. So if you ask for just a straightforward summary of a historical event, that is what you will get uh, without a particular point of view usually. You can ask ChatGPT to kind of append a point of view, um, but obviously if by point of view we mean like from the student's own perspective and connected to the classroom material, it's not going to be able to do that. ChatGPT is great at straightforward mathematical pro uh, problem solving equations and identifying errors in code. And indeed, before I largely stopped using ChatGPT, one of the things I found it most effective at is checking my own crappy CSS for figuring out where the errors in my websites were. Um, and I genuinely do miss that application of it because it's much better than me at that. And I am very, very, I mean, I'm not very accomplished at code. So like, it wouldn't be hard to be better at me than that, but it was a very convenient tool to have at my disposal. Conversely, ChatGPT is or tends towards being bad at assignments that require demonstrating process, not including mathematical showing of work here, but um, the more sort of steps you build check-ins with your learners, the more um, clear it is that ChatGPT becomes less efficient as a resource, right? If they have to keep going back to that, the same kind of argument well, um, at a certain point it becomes kind of more time and labor uh, efficient to, to just do the work themselves. Um, assignments that demand deep and careful engagement. So this is a real example of where the more um, detailed your assessment guidelines are, the more clear and explicit you are about what you are looking for in the assessment, and the more it connects to the classroom practice, the better. Um, we see that a lot with, um, you know, uh, sorry, let me rewind. A common thing that I have in my office is people coming to me and saying like, I know that the student did this work with ChatGPT. And currently at the moment, we do not allow for the use of AI detectors at TRU. They're not accepted by our Academic Integrity Committee as evidence because of all kinds of natural justice issues. Um, and so the instructor will say to me, well, what do I do? Like, I know that this is ChatGPT generated. And the first thing I always say is like, have you just marked it against your own criteria for the assessment? And oftentimes they do that and they're like, oh, oh, this assignment does not do well against my actual criteria. And again, it's that difference between an, assess like an assessment looking good on the surface and the ways in which that can kind of lull us into a sense of an assessment being better than it is um, versus what is actually happening like when you dig into the argument and see what students are doing. Likewise, assignments that include reflective practice, obviously ChatGPT does not have your learner's lived experience, nor does it have what happens in the classroom. So connecting to a kind of reflective practice that um, requires students to make those connections is helpful. Uh, and ChatGPT is really bad at real citations. Although I will say, this is something that they have fixed in the most recent update. So it used to be you could ask it to generate a list of citations and they would all just be like my book in my plagiarism case, uh, made up. And um, that, <clears throat> That was really annoying for the librarians at my institution. I don't know if any librarians on the call have had this experience, but the research help desk was inundated with people coming up with like a list of sources because they've been told to go find 10 sources about their topic. So they doop -ba -doop -ba -doo into chat GPT and it's generated 10 sources and they'd walk up to the research help desk like, can you find me these? And the answer was 
No, because they're all entirely fictional. Um, I went to replicate that the other day when I was testing uh, something. And now what it says is, you say, I need 10 sources on X. It says, oh, you should go and talk to a librarian about that. So someone has gone in there and kind of cut that off at the source, much to the delight, I'm sure, of all librarians everywhere. So here are some kind of swaps to consider. Um, and I think that these are all things that work in blended and online environments with the caveat that it depends on how your online environment is structured and the extent to which you have like one-on-one -on -one time to reflect with learners. So in the context of TRU, a lot of our online courses are um, asynchronous and you may not have that one-on-one -on -one time uh, with a learner. So advice I'm giving here, like uh, having students evaluate steps towards an argument might be more complicated by that. But, you know, instead of a summary or a precy where maybe an AI tool, ChatGPT or otherwise, could just be generating the summary, consider doing an annotation exercise instead. In fact, to what extent do you need to collect the actual summary versus seeing the students thinking on the page, right? Um, there are technologies that help with this for those of you who are teaching exclusively in the online context. I don't know if Brock uses Hypothesis, but that's a great tool for going through. Anne is nodding to me. That's a great tool for having students work through an annotation exercise alone or in groups uh, and something that you can then evaluate, right? Because if the goal of the summary is like, did you understand the article? Maybe you don't need the summary to see whether or not the learner understood the article. And you're gonna hear that in my responses a lot, right? And uh, maybe it's uh, sacrilegious for an ex-English instructor, but I really think we should be thinking about how often we fall back on long form writing instead of other ways of demonstrating learning and knowledge. Uh, short paragraph responses, what about turning those into structured discussions with POV? Um, so that's easy to do in a classroom, obviously, like you take this perspective, you take this perspective, discuss. But we've had really good success with um, instructors having students do these over, like we use Big Blue Button, it's our video chat function. So like you can have students record in a in a video call room and you can just view that recording for evaluation. Um, you could also have them use like um, Kaltura as our video service, but you know, you can have them record these or even just record the audio for an even more lightweight option for learners. Um, instead of a lengthy bibliography, like it's really easy to generate a list of sources. And the reality is like lengthy bibliographies were always kind of a terrible assignment. And I, I just mean, I used to have my learners do my bibliography because that's what I did. And it would be like, we'd have one of five topics that they could select from because that's how the course was designed. And basically what at least 60% of the class would hand in was whatever the first five library sources were for that keyword, right? Like that would be the bibliography. So I didn't love that assignment before generative AI and I'm sure I would just dread it now. But what about a single source deep dive? What about instead of having students show a surface demonstration of a bunch of sources, we have them dig in to a single one. And maybe the development of the research paper is them doing that more than once towards a research paper at the end that maybe has fewer sources, but a better understanding of each of them. Uh, as I said before, instead of one major essay, we do steps towards an argument. So one major essay worth 40%. That's always been a high stakes cheating moment. That's always susceptible for contract cheating, it's equally susceptible for generative AI, but a bunch of assessment components worth 5% each instead. Again, as soon as we diffuse the high stress, high stakes environment, we reduce the temptation for cheating. And there's, you know, there's tons of research to back that notion up. Um, and instead of objectively reporting on facts, what if we had students engage more in the process of reflective practice, connecting those events or ideas or experiences to their own. So you can see why I frame this as a problem of scale, right? The level of those are hard things to do at scale. If you've got students in the hundreds, you probably aren't going to have them do multiple deep dives into individual research articles, right? It's not that I like relish being the doom merchant and say, hey, try all these things that you don't have the workflow for. But I do think it's really important that we talk about the extent to which we are trapped by the mechanisms of our of our institutions. And that if we really want to address challenges like generative AI 
head on, well, that's going to require some structural change, right? You all know that learning is relational. We learn in community with others. That doesn't necessarily mean in a classroom. That can absolutely mean over a video chat. That can absolutely mean over an asynchronous connection. But learning is relational. And the more students to an individual teacher, the more difficult that relationship is to build and the more difficult it is to sustain. And I think that that's a really critical component. Thank you. I had a coffee delivered. Um, restoring this relationality is the first step to meaningfully educating students. And we were far away from that before generative AI, but I think that the advent of generative AI may hopefully make us rethink some of our practices. That's, what, that's my hopeful, that's my hopeful self. But now we're gonna rethink everything and do it all properly. Um, I know I've already said this, but I can't talk about AI and not talk about AI detectors and caution you against their use. Um, so there's sources for all of this in the um, in the notes for today. But the same, I think the same kinds of policing insults, insults, sorry, the same kinds of policing impulses that gave us the turn it in to contract cheating cycle that I've already talked about will also fail here. I believe. I believe they always fail. These tools are inaccurate. They show bias against already marginalized learners. You'll see uh, a citation in the notes for bias against language learners, but we're also increasingly seeing bias against neuroatypical learners. Um, they also, I think, paint over the structural problems we're recognizing, right? So like, I've just spent 23 slides telling you that these problems are all structural. So I'm probably also going to tell you that just papering over it with an AI detector is not the answer. That said, I understand why we go there, right? We go there for the same reason why we went to turn it in in the first place. Um, these tools have very high positive, false positivity ratings, which I think is an important piece of this puzzle. Sometimes it's high, I, well, it depends on the research. I think the most reliable study that I've seen says about 26% false positivity. Um, that is way too high. But it's also, when we think about false positivity specifically, and we think about the larger consequences of a finding of, I, I dislike the legal language we use for this, but the a finding of guilt in an academic integrity hearing, that can mean a learner doesn't go to law school, right? So if we think about a 26% false positivity rating and the larger consequences of those judgments over time, I think we really need to stop and think about other ways forward. Uh, and also, we really need to investigate our biases when it comes to what is AI-generated text and what isn't. So I'm very grateful to Rua Williams last July for sharing these screenshots on Twitter. This was a discussion that, um, or an exchange that Williams underwent with a colleague. Uh, Williams received this email. The AI design of your email is clever, but significantly lacks warmth. Would it be possible to be contacted by a human being moving forward instead of AI? To which Williams responded, uh, it's not an AI, I'm just autistic. I'll see you next Friday. What biases, what biases and what ableist assumptions underpin what we believe is obviously AI or obviously not? Um, another example of this is, you know, I've had people in my office hours. Um, I our team holds regular office hours so the community can come drop in and ask questions. And a, a common thing I hear is like, well, I know this student is an international student, and now their assignments are in perfect English, so it's definitely AI. And there's a lot of bias in that assumption as well, right? And so I think that if there's not going to be a technological solution to this, and there just isn't, it's just going to be an arms race. Detectors will get better, AI will get better at evading. Detectors will get better, AI will get better at evading. Um, we need to, first of all, investigate the impulse to police, um, which I've already shared with you, I have too, right? I'm super annoyed about that email that was clearly generated generated by AI that the person didn't disclose. Um, but not because it wasn't warm, but because like how much water went into you making this goofball email that could have been two sentences uh, written off the side of your desk. Um, and at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge to each other that we don't have a perfect way to police, right? And so Exchanges like this are certainly not the way forward, but that doesn't mean that AI detectors are either. 
So I'm always going to give the last word to Audrey Waters, who is no longer working in the educational technology space, but is still someone whose work informs a lot of what I do. And this is from her essay titled Hashtag Team Luddite, uh, which I've linked to in the notes. The problem isn't simply the technology in and of itself. Are you for it or against it? It's that technology is necessarily encased in structures and systems that we need to interrogate. And those who are quick to dismiss criticism of technology as somehow being against the future are often those most invested in protecting the structures and systems of ongoing exploitation. And with that, uh, I'll just note that as we embark on a new era of education, I think we need to think about how our values are represented or not in the tools we choose. And I think that those conversations need to be a lot more open than they have been up to this point. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, you're more than welcome to follow up with me by email, bgray at tru.ca. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a chat. I'm just gonna, just gonna take my slides down and see all of your faces again. There we go. Okay. Thanks so much, Brenna. That was fantastic.